Okay, so we're heading into our last section of Lecture 5 on Male Anatomy and Physiology. We're going to be talking about emission and ejaculation, and then we're going to be talking about a few other anatomical features, primarily anal anatomy. And I just didn't want that in the title because YouTube, whatever. So here we go. So emission and ejaculation. So emission is probably something that you haven't heard of before um, because it usually just kind of gets lumped in with ejaculation and that's something that everybody's familiar with. But there are actually two separate phenomena, two separate things that are happening. The first is emission where the sperm and the fluids are getting ready to go and prepped and kind of loaded. And then the second is ejaculation where you actually push the semen out of the penile urethra. So this normally typically occurs in male-bodied people at orgasm, right? So at the sexual peak, the sympathetic nervous system, so you might remember erection was from the parasympathetic nervous system, emission and ejaculation is from the sympathetic nervous system. So first we get emission, which is like getting everybody in the starting blocks and ready to go, and then we have ejaculation where they actually take off. So in a little bit more detail, so emission. So remember the vas deferens has muscle in the wall of that tube. So it's gonna squeeze and squeeze the, move the sperm up out of the scrotum into the pelvis back behind the bladder there. Then the bulbourethral glands are gonna release their pre-ejaculate to clear things through like a Zamboni. And then the seminal vesicles and prostate are gonna squirt their fluids into the ducts. And so then the semen then, which now we have the fluid and the sperm all together, is going to move into the urethra, right? So that's getting onto the starting box, getting ready. And the person will then feel a sense of what's described as ejaculatory inevitability, right? So this is when you're like, okay, it's, it's about to happen any moment now. And we move into the main event, which is, which is ejaculation. And what happens is there are contractions in the columns of the penis that are then going to force the semen out of the penis and out through that urethral meatus. So we actually have two different things. Emission is like on your mark, get set. And then ejaculation is go. So we're going to talk about a couple of other features of anatomy. So the anus is really interesting from an anatomical standpoint. So the first thing I want to talk about is the inner lining on the inside of the anus because we have two different types depending on what part of the anus we're talking about. So let's see, I'm going to use my green pen here. And so out here in the outer part of the anus, closest to the outside of your body, we have what's called stratified squamous epithelium. And that's shown underneath the microscope here, this section right here. And what you're seeing is many, so many cells piled one on top of each other. So this lining of the inside of the anus is, you know, 10, 20 cells thick, right? And it's not until you get beneath all those layers of cells that you encounter things like blood vessels and nerves, right? The deeper insides of your body. Higher up, however, so I'm going to use a different color. Let's use purple. So up here, however, is a different type of lining of the inside of the anus, and that is called columnar epithelium. And it's this part over here. And you see how thin that is. It's just one cell layer thick. So that's really important to realize because that lining of the inside of the anus higher up is a lot more delicate. Right? It's just one cell layer thick before you get to blood vessels and nerves. So that is, can be more easily torn. So that's an interesting thing about the anus. The other interesting thing is that where these two types of tissues meet right here, a transition zone between the two different types of inner cell lining, is called the squamocolumnar junction. Now, what's important about the squamocolumnar junction, it's just called that because it's like you have the columnar cells on one side and the stratified squamous cells on the other side. So it's the squamocolumnar junction. And what's important about that is that's a place in the body that the HPV virus, HPV, which is a sexually transmitted infection, that's where it likes to infect. And we'll find that in some other places in the human body too, including on the cervix in female bodied people. So that's going to come up again in the future. Other things about the anus. 
One is that we have sphincters. So sphincters are these little circular kind of like purse, <laughs> purse string like muscles that can squeeze down and open up. I can't. Uh, uh. Right. They, <laughs> there we go. They can squeeze down or they can open up. So we have two for the anus. The internal one is involuntary. The external one is voluntary. And so the way it works is, you know, your intestines are digesting stuff and you get to the point where you have all this waste now that is coming through the colon or the large intestine. It needs to be eliminated. So it's getting peristalsed through and it's going to arrive in the rectum. When it arrives in the rectum, you go, oh, I think I have to go poop. <laughs> and the internal sphincter will often open. Thankfully, we have an external sphincter, which starting around age two to three, we all get voluntary control over so we don't have an accident in our pants. So that's the first thing. The other thing that's really interesting about this is that this part of our digestive system is also a part of our digestive system that's possible, that's capable of reverse peristalsis. So what happens, like say you're in the middle of class and all of a sudden this material arrives in your rectum and you go, oh, I have to go poop. Then you go, but there's this really exciting thing happening in class right now. I don't want to have to get up and leave. So what will happen if after several minutes or moments you do not get up and go to the bathroom is that the rectum will actually push the material back up. So you will actually lose that sensation of needing to use the bathroom. And in fact, if you try to go, it will be difficult. You might be able to still make it happen, but it would be difficult because everything's kind of been moved back. So that's going to be important in a minute too. We also have a lot of veins that are present around the anus shown in the blue on the diagram. That's called the hemorrhoidal plexus. So we use the word plexus a lot of times if there's like a whole bunch of veins, just like the pampiniform plexus in the scrotum. And the a neat thing about the anus is it gets its nerve supply from the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve is what also supplies the genitalia. So that's interesting. And the anus itself does not have any lubricating or moisturizing glands to speak of. It has a few just to make sure that stool can pass through, but it doesn't have much capacity in terms of natural lubrication. So this is really important if you're using the anus for sex, right? So there's reason to understand why anal stimulation can be sexually pleasurable, right? It has the same nerve supply as the external genitalia, that pudendal nerve. But we have to remember that inner higher up lining is delicate, that simple columnar epithelium, so it can be prone to tearing if you're not careful, if you're rough. We have that squamocolumnar junction, which can get infected with HPV. And we also have no natural lubrication. So if you're gonna engage in any anal sex or anal sex play, you have to use some type of lubricant because there just won't be sufficient um, on its own. And then finally, because this area is capable of reverse peristalsis, there's this thing that can happen, and believe me, as a healthcare provider, this does happen, that if you put something into the anus that could accidentally get pulled up in there, that can actually happen, and things can get kind of pulled up and get stuck um, because if they're not something that's smooth and aerodynamic for the body to then push back out. So it's really important then if you're um, doing any type of anal sex play with a toy that it has a flared base. So let me show you. Um, yeah, let me show you what that looks like. Okay, so these things on the left have a flared base. So what'll happen, let me get a pen here, is right. So if you insert this part into your body, right, your body will kind of naturally close around it here, right? And then you have this nice wide flared base so that it can't get pulled up into your body. So any toy that's designed for anal sex play has to have some type of wide flared base so it doesn't accidentally get pulled up inside of the body. So you can see on the right hand side the things that are not okay right, are things that don't have that separate wide flared base to prevent them from getting lost. Believe me, um, believe me this happens right so don't let it happen to you it's a pretty embarrassing thing um, and we often end up having to do surgery to actually get these items out of somebody's body
So word to the wise, use lube, and if it's a toy, make sure it has a flared base. All right. Last thing I want to talk about are the pelvic floor muscles. So this diagram that we see here, you might be like, what in the world are we looking at? So ooh, let me grab a little visual aid. OK, so here's my person, right? Here's my person. So what we're actually looking at is this view here. So except their legs have been spread apart. So we're actually looking head on to what is deep to or behind in a male bodied person where the scrotum is. So you can see the anus, the anal opening is right here. Okay, the urethra, which is going to come out into the penis, is there. And so all of this kind of reddish brown material that we're seeing, these are muscles because there's no bone down there on the floor of the pelvis that's keeping all of our organs inside of our body, right? There's no bones there. Um, they're off to the side, as you can see here. And you can even kind of reach down underneath your um, bottom where you're sitting and you can feel those bones on each side, right, but not in the middle, which is good because we have to be able to get poop out through there, so bones would be problematic. But we have muscles instead. So if you've ever heard of like the pubococcygeus or the PC muscle or reading some men's health magazine that exercising your muscles can improve your sexual function, I don't know, maybe some people seem to report that is the case. Um, we know that these muscles contribute to those sphincter muscles, both for urinary and fecal or anal continence, right? Being able to control those functions. Um, it may help contribute to sexual function to kind of exercise those muscles and have control over them. Um, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, these muscles do contract during orgasm just naturally. Um, so sometimes you might feel that. And that's what that is. So in summary, right, so we have emission, which is getting, get ready, get set, and then ejaculation, which is go. And then for the anal anatomy, remember, we have those two different types of linings. The one is kind of delicate. When we have that junction where the two meet, which is susceptible to infection with HPV. There's a hemorrhoidal plexus of veins. I'll bet you can guess what abnormality we'll talk about next week that can be due to a problem with that. And then there's no natural lubrication. So you have to use some type of lube for anal sex play. Same nerve su supply as the genitals with the pudendal nerve, which is why it can be sexually pleasurable. And you have to be careful because of that reverse peristalsis. Things can get pulled up into the rectum and lost. And then we touched briefly on those pelvic floor muscles, which may or may not contribute significantly to sexual function. So that's it for male anatomy and physiology.